Good afternoon. I'm John Weber, the Executive Director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art here at the University of Oregon. And it's great to have all of you online for today's program with Ron Jude. In conjunction with our current show, Ron Jude 12 Hertz, we have a wonderful program set up for you today. And a couple notes first. We do have the chat turned off on the side, but we have the question, question and answer turned on. And there will be uh, question of answer period at the end of the program today. So you, if you have questions along the way, um, feel free to um, make a note of them then or, or save them for the end. Um, I will do brief introductions and then turn over the microphone to Toby Jurovics, who is the curator of Ron's show. Uh, Toby is the uh, director of the Barry Lopez Foundation for Art and Environment, which organized this show and brought it to us. And he was the chief curator of American Western art at the Joc Jocelyn Art Museum from 2011 to 2020. Uh, prior to this, he was curator of photography at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Princeton University Art Museum. He's curated over 50 monographic and group exhibitions of photography, painting, works on paper and new media in his career. Now this show focuses on the work of Ron Jude, who is represented by Gallery Luizotti in Santa Monica and Gallery Robert Morat in Berlin, Germany. He is a 2019 Guggenheim Fellow, shows widely in the US and abroad, including at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, the Photographer's Gallery in London, Daegu Culture and Art Center in South Korea, the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, and many more. Since 2006, there have been about 16 monographs published on his work, and happily, he is on the studio art faculty here at the University of Oregon in our College of Design. So it's great to be both showing and doing a program with one of our own. Uh, Ron and Toby will be joined by Alan Rempel, who is a full professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at the UO. His research is directed towards understanding the fundamental interactions that govern a broad spectrum of natural processes. Much of this work centers on the fluid mechanics, solid mechanics, and thermodynamics that control interactions between solids and fluids, especially near the melting transition. And so as you'll see, he's a perfect discussant and contributor to a program on, on Ron's work. Um, he holds a PhD from Cambridge University and did undergraduate masters and master's work and undergraduate work at the University of British Columbia. And finally, they will be joined by Danielle Knapp, who's been on the curatorial staff of the JSMA for 12 years now. She is the museum's Makosh curator, focusing on art of the Pacific Northwest and American art. She's also the curator of two of our current shows, Meeting Points and Rick Silva Western Fronts. She's also been in the Schnitzer Gallery, where Ron's show is, working with students touring through the exhibition as part of their academic work at the university. And the academic work that we do with our exhibitions is a key component of our mission as a teaching museum. So we're very happy to have Danielle here today to share some of that with you. Now, it's my great pleasure to turn the program over to you, Toby. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. And um, uh, I just want to, uh, I want to thank John and um, Hans Sempere, the cur uh, curator of photography and the staff at the um, Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, um, just because of the uh, intricacies of the past two years. Um, this is the first time I've organized an exhibition that I haven't been around to. Um, uh, well, I never saw the prints um, until two weeks ago uh, and uh, never saw the installation. And it is just a spectacularly uh, a beautiful installation. And also um, uh, Ron was a great stand in uh, thank you, during the uh, during the installation. But uh, we uh, expect that the exhibition will travel to three to five other venues. And I know it will never look as good as it does right now. So thank you to everybody at the Schnitzer. Um, and there really couldn't be a more appropriate uh, place uh, for the Barry Lopez Foundation for Art and Environment to begin its programs. Um, I think as many of you uh, in the area know, Barry lived in Finn Rock on the Mackenzie River for over 50 years. Um, so he was, uh, was sort of in his, um, in his home ground. Uh, for those of you, uh, just to familiarize you a little with Barry, he was the author of Arctic Dreams, Imagination and Desire in a Northern, Northern Landscape. Uh, which received the National Book Award for Nonfiction in 1986, of Wolves and Men, 
eight works of fiction, including Winter Count and Field Notes, and two collections of essays. Uh, and then a third, uh, a third collection is on its way this spring, Embrace Fearlessly the Burning World. Uh, his last book, Horizon, uh, which was a narrative of 50 years of travel and exploration to every continent, was published in 2019. Um, and in 1986, uh, when he won the National Book Award, he said, even though I appear to write largely about other landscapes and animals, what is in my gut as a writer is concerned with the fate of the country I live in and the dignity and morality of the people I live with. And, um, you know, I think that I think that that's really the sort of the critical, uh, the, the sort of critical juncture that the foundation tries to work with is what is this? Uh, uh, where do where does landscape and um, uh, you know sort of personal interaction and morality and ethics um, interact? And how do we how do we sort of build a dialogue around that? And the um, the foundation actually began with the conversation in Eugene at uh, we we're having lunch at Vero. And Barry said to me, how do you visualize a global catastrophe? And I thought, well, there are a lot of good artists working on that. And how do we, how do we sort of build something together? So the foundation organizes exhibitions about climate change, habitat loss, species extinction, and the way that our relationship with the landscape is gonna change um, in the coming century. We work exclusively with contemporary artists and we circulate these exhibitions and installations to museums and galleries in the US free of charge. Um, and if you go on our, our website, the mission statement reads, creating an ethical relationship with the land in a time of environmental crisis. Um, and I just wanna read a quote from uh, Barry's friend, Robert McFarlane, uh, who was also a, um, a landscape writer in Britain. And this is the introduction that he wrote to a issue a reissue of home ground. It's like, what, what does that really mean? How do we create that kind of relationship? And uh, he writes, the lesson that Barry Lopez taught me, though it would take me longer to understand it, was that while writing about landscape often begins in the aesthetic, it must always tend to the ethical. Lopez's intense attentiveness was, I came to later realize, a form of moral gaze, born of his belief that if we attend more closely to something, then we are less likely to act selfishly towards it. To exercise a care of attention towards a place as towards a person is to achieve a sympathy, or pardon me, a sympathetic intimacy with it. Um, and so those are, that's really the guiding principle um, that, that we, uh, that sort of we established the foundation on. And, you know, as somebody, uh, a colleague asked me, he goes, well, how's an exhibition gonna stop global warming? And I thought the best answer to that was to say, it's not. Um, you know, it's very unlikely that uh, what is happening at the museum is going to have a, you know, a, a, uh, a, you know, any kind of marked change on the course the planet is on. But what we really believe is that the kind of transformative experience uh, that can occur in front of a work of art is the same kind of experience that you have when you're in the landscape. And uh, whether that's an intellectual or personal or emotional, uh, and that's the sort of space that we're trying to uh, to create with our programs. And I think that you would be um, very hard pressed to uh, find a body of work and an artist that does this better than uh, than Ron Jude. Um, and I just before I uh, turn this over to you, Ron, I just want to acknowledge um, uh, our friend Teresa Lazzotti, who I believe is out in the audience today. And uh, Teresa has represented Ron for many years, and she was the one that uh, brought this body of work to my attention. And uh, so I want to thank you for sort of shepherding this, uh, shepherding this project forward. But as, as soon as I saw, um, uh, saw this project, I thought this is, you know, this is the best way for us to really um, launch this mission in, uh, into the world. So Ron, I'll let you um, uh, introduce uh, 12 Hertz and talk a little bit about um, the title and how that reflects back on the project. Okay, thank you, Toby. And uh, uh, thanks, John, for the introductions. And I'm uh, really grateful for Alan and uh, Danielle uh, being here with us today as well. Um, 
So I'll just I'll just go ahead and uh, sort of introduce the work and go through a few slides, not only of some of the images in the work, but also uh, the installation at the JSMA to sort of uh, uh, give the audience a sense of how this uh, work comes together in an installation. Uh, but I'll start with the, the basics. Um, the title, 12 Hertz, is the lowest sound threshold of human hearing. Uh, it suggests imperceptible forces from plate tectonics to the ocean tides, from cycles of growth and decay in the forest to the incomprehensibility of geological spans of time. The photographs in 12 Hertz allude to the ungraspable scale and veiled mechanics of these phenomena, while acknowledging a desire to gain a broader perspective beyond the human enterprise in a time of ecological and political crisis. So, you know, at the outset of, of making this body of work, you know, as with any body of work, it's, it's never really a body of work uh, until you get a little ways into it and you actually start to see something crystallize and you start to understand it for what else it could be besides uh, just a collection of pictures. Um, but I did have uh, pretty early on this uh, title for the work as I began looking at the landscape in earnest here in Oregon. And the idea that I wanted to suggest the idea of um, thresholds of perception, um, that to do that visually becomes you know, almost an impossible challenge, but it, it became something that I, I thought I could at least sort of imply or suggest through the things I was looking at and how I was looking at them. Um, so the title gave me a way to sort of um, not direct uh, our attention to something visual, but direct our attention to something um, audible, another sense, another uh, uh, sort of uh, threshold of uh, perception with another sense. And so that became the sort of catalyst for the things I started to look at. I was really interested in um, taking the human element out of these works. Um, I've never really done a pure body of landscape work in earnest prior to this body of work, uh, although I've been a big fan of uh, landscape photography since uh, my early days in college, uh, specifically um, the new topographics work by uh, photographers such as uh, Robert Adams, another Oregonian, uh, Burden and Hilla Betcher, um, Stephen Shore, et cetera. Um, but one of my thoughts about these photographers, and as much as I admire the work and as impactful as it was on my, my own thinking about photography, was that I, you know, I thought in 2017, we were operating under a completely different set of circumstances than we were in the 60s and 70s. And the, the questions that these photographers asked were important questions, certainly for the time. And it sort of uh, sent us off in a, an important direction with the medium in terms of how we might represent the landscape in a, a sort of unsentimentalized and very real way. Uh, but I also thought that you know, those questions had been asked and I, I wondered, would it be possible to look at a pure landscape, the one that didn't have human intervention, one that didn't have juxtapositions and ironies and a clear sort of critical point and still make relevant uh, work with a sort of tension uh, that resides in the work and not simply make photographs of the landscape in a sentimental way? Um, so that was the big question for me, and to some degree, it still is a question. I mean, it's it's uh, that became the working premise, and you know, as the the person making the work, you never really fully understand whether or not you accomplished what you wanted to accomplish. Um, but I I knew from the outset that I wanted to look at the basic elements of the planet. I wanted to look at the mechanics of the planet. Um, I was interested in basic things like rock, water, ice, how those things move. Um, how they are constantly in flux and changing uh, outside of our perception and to make photographs in a way or in a manner that suggested that these things were happening all around us all the time. Um, I, I made photographs here in Oregon for the first couple of years. Um, uh, I found just about everything I wanted to find right here within about a two hour drive of Eugene, uh, whether you go west or east, this uh, landscape here is uh, filled with sort of phenomenal, uh, sort of amazing things to look at. 
at a certain point though I, I there were things that i wanted to uh to sort of amplify in the work um things that i couldn't quite get to in oregon and so i um with with the help of a fellowship i traveled to uh iceland and made photographs of glaciers uh the east slope of Kilauea in Hawaii um, to look at uh, fresh lava flows. And it was really just sort of at the, the tail end of 2019 and going into 2020, right before the pandemic, that I was sort of finishing up uh, principal uh, photography on uh, this body of work. But the idea here was to really create pictures that could not necessarily in a sort of lockstep sequential order, but could exist with each other in a space, in an installation, and really sort of amplify and suggest motion, fluid dynamics, the things that are constantly happening, whether it's something that we can perceive or whether it's something that's happening so slowly that we can't, uh, can't quite get it. And so you have images like the Cabin Glacier and the marine layer uh, breakers uh, residing uh, in a, the same sort of visual sight line uh, with one another in the installation. Um, one thing I did want to mention uh, just briefly is that this in the installation at the JSMA, this is sort of the introductory um, uh, piece. It's a, a lava plain in Northern California um, with um, what appears to be fog that is in fact a, a really thick forest fire smoke that was happening at the time that I made this image. And in the installation, uh, this image resides next to a text piece that the writer Paul Kings North wrote specifically for 12 Hertz. Um, I won't read the whole thing, but one of the things I was interested in doing with this collaboration was, and with the other collaboration that I'll talk about in a minute, was to sort of um, have a text piece that spoke to the spirit of the work, but didn't actually describe the work or didn't explain the work. Um, but that through reading this piece, you might sort of come to a better understanding of how the work was supposed to function. So these are just a, a few other uh, installation shots of the show that's up now at the JSMA. And I've got just a, a couple of location shots here. Um, this is that calving glacier image. This is in Iceland. Um, my guide and I got to this spot. Uh, it, uh, according to, to my guide, it must have been within uh, just a couple of hours of this gla glacier having calved because the, the blue ice hadn't yet oxidized. Uh, it was still quite fresh. And um, one of the questions that has been coming up consistently with this exhibition was a question of scale. Um, how big are these things? What are we looking at? How, you know, where would a human being uh, situate themselves in relation to this landscape? And quite intentionally, I, I wanted to sort of um, imply a sense of scale through the removal of scale. Um, there, many of the photographs uh, lack a horizon line um, which give you a completely uh, diminished sense of scale, um, almost a sense of abstraction in the landscape. Um, but uh, anecdotally, at least, uh, outside of the experience of the exhibition, you can sort of see that's me and that's what I'm looking at. And it's quite large enough to uh, swallow a human being whole. And that scale became important in the production of the work as well. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, I went through a number of prototypes trying to figure out what sort of impact this work needed to have from a sense of scale in order to do what I wanted it to do. And I found that the uh, smaller prints of this work, because I certainly don't believe that bigger is better in every case, but smaller prints of this particular work seemed um, to reside dangerously close to what I would describe as fine art landscape photography. And uh, the scale of the work in this form, I thought had a completely different kind of impact and a completely different um, legibility in terms of the kind of uh, spaces that I wanted uh, the work to occupy.
Ron, I just like to um, just want to go back to uh, something you just said. That sense of um, uh, you know when you were showing that uh, you standing on the glacier and then the image, and you said you know, this is something that can swallow you whole. And um, there's a there's a kind of implied uh, kind of implied threat in a lot of these uh, in a lot of the images. And I think it's it's sort of interesting that. Um, you know, I think everybody uh, kind of thinks, well, landscape photography is something that's pretty, you know, pretty easily done. You know, it's like, you know, you put the mountain, you know, in the center and the clouds go on the top and the rivers at the bottom, boom, there you go. Um, but that you use that phrase sentimental. And I think, I think that um, I would even say that, that landscape photographs are supposed to be kind of comfortable um, or reassuring. And, um, can you can you talk a little bit a, a little bit about that? Um, I mean, they're they're not um, they're not photographs that um, kind of leave you at ease. Yeah, I, I uh, part of the attempt to you know make photographs of the landscape that didn't um, operate on a level of sentimentality was to sort of build into them a certain amount of hostility. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I uh, hopefully wouldn't characterize them as overwrought, but I, you know, I, I do think that there is a kind of an, an imposing presence to the work that isn't necessarily inviting and um, not to embed or imply too much sort of narrative to the work. Um, but one of the things I was interested in was, this, you know, the mechanics of the planets, you know, the, the indifference to our presence. Uh, these things are just sort of happening, and as you've you know written about so eloquently, of course we do have an impact on the planet. We are uh, driving it uh, in a very uh, specific direction at this point, but ultimately, you know, all of these things could care less about us. And um, one of the things I was interested in doing was sort of to take us out of the narrative, which is, of course, a paradox. It's impossible. Uh, but to as much as possible, make this about the things I'm looking at specifically and not about us and not about our story um, and not about how we fit into it. I think um, uh, looking at that uh, Paul McKinks North quote, which um, uh, if anybody would like to see it, it's on our on our website on, on Ron's page. Um, but that very last line where, you know, he's sort of going through this, you know, this sort of litany of human endeavors. And then he said, beneath all of this is rock. And it really, it almost like pulls the rug out from under you. And there's this real sense of, um, uh, you know, the rock just doesn't care. Um, and it seems even sort of greater than indifference that it's just, you know, it's sort of, in, you know, completely impenetrable to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to any of our concerns. Um, maybe um, Alan, uh, if, um, uh, if you wanted to jump in, I mean, does it, <laughs> I know that that um, even though we sort of all claim to be, you know, uh, moderately um, objective here, you know, just in the way Ron and I are talking about it, you sort of can't help but sort of imply this narrative onto the onto the landscape and coming at it from a more scientific um, point of view. How does how does that dialogue? I mean, how does that dialogue kind of strike you? And and how do you think about it when you when you look at these images? Well, I, I th thank you, um, and thanks for, for uh, allowing me to participate in this. Um, I think that, that uh, a lot of what Ron has said and what you said earlier um, really does strike me um, as uh, things that attract me to the work as well. It, you know, in, in their sciences, it's, it's a very broad field. We borrow from all the basic sciences to try to tease out how the earth works. And, and a lot of that is about the dynamics of processes. And so we see in some of these images with um, the, the waves up against the rock, you know, obviously there's motion that we can infer in the, in the water that, um, that we don't really usually think about with the rock as being a more permanent feature. Um, but then we see rock falls in some of the images that are looking an awful lot like the glacier calving, you know, which is so, sort of an intermediate in between those two sets of behaviors. Um, and, and I think that, you know, my colleagues and I, a lot of us are, are drawn to study these, these processes because of the beauty and what we see around us and because of our interest in, in, um, 
in how things work beyond the human scale, um, both in time and in space and, and the, the aspects of it that we can't see, you know, we can't see below the foam on top of the waves and we can't see, um, you know, what's behind, uh, you know, what's, what's the glacier sliding on, you know, does, does the dirt on top of it mean anything? Um, you know, what, what's living in there? I mean, it all looks very stark and dead, but, um, but under a microscope, it isn't. Um, and, um, and so, you know, being able to, you know, I, I was struck by what Ron was saying about, um, you know, the sense of scale, these images that we're looking at right now, where it's difficult to, to, to judge whether that's, you know, uh, 10 meters across, or, or is it two meters across, or, or, or 20 centimeters. Um, and you wouldn't know that um, just by by looking at the image right now, um, but there's there's uh, just all of the different scales and all of the different dynamics are aspects of nature that that just capture a lot of imagination and and um, the idea of applying basic physical principles towards understanding it better is is what draws us to to this field. Um, Ron, I don't know if um, if you can go back to that very first image of um, the uh, the cliff at the cliff face at night. Okay. Um, I'm gonna have to do it like this. Okay. Do I mean, one of the, you know, it's it's. Um, there we go. Um, one of the things that uh, that sort of struck me, um, and th uh, this was one of the prints that uh, that I saw last summer, um, is that I mean, um, Alan, we were sort of talking about, um, you know, how we how we sort of visually react to to landscapes and how that how that shapes um, how that shapes our understanding of things. And so, you know, I mean, it's interesting to hear you use the word beauty. Like we we just can't. You know, we're not built to really sort of get around that. Um, but one of the things that I really liked about how these photographs work is that I think that they they put you in that sort of physical, in that physical space. Um, and you know, Ron, when you were saying like if they're smaller, they begin to look like you know sort of you know standard you know your your you know traditional you know scenic landscape. Um, but what I liked about this picture, when you talk about that idea of of, of twelve hertz being the sort of lowest. Um, you know the lowest threshold of of hearing, and you when you try to imagine that, you know you can you you kind of see yourself sort of con like you know almost like closing your eyes and concentrating, try to pull that sound from the background. And when I look at this photograph, um, you know I feel like you do the same thing. It's like you you feel like you're standing there, you know at at you know midnight and sort of waiting for your eyes to open up and sort of take in the, you know, take in uh, take in what's in front of you. And um, can you talk a little bit about how you tried to put that kind of physicality in 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 um, in the images that way? I mean that 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 the experience of being in front of them gives you that that sense of place. Yeah, well, I mean, I I, I think without thinking about it too literally, as I was making the work, I was definitely I had a few things that I was uh, hoping to. Do do in terms of my perspective on my subjects. I wanted it to be almost a sort of disembodied feeling, um, removing that sense of scale. And then uh, with the particular camera that I was using, which is the first time I'd ever used it, um, I, I was able to do things that I hadn't been able to do up, up to that point. Images such as this one, where you can sort of open up all the detail in something that's almost completely uh, uh, absent of light, um, photographing breaking waves in a sea cave, uh, stopping that motion, um, which I know is basic photography stuff, but it's also the kind of technical problem that was interesting to me to see if I could solve it and then have that translate into something that was meaningful. Um, and that's that became a sort of working checklist for me as I, I as I made the work. 
you know, never as a goal in itself, but, but as a way to sort of convey a certain kind of impact or meaning through the work. And, and not to get too sort of hung up on the technical details, but um, what you're really talking about is that shift from film to, to digital. And that, that the sensor gives you, you have a different ability with the digital sensor than you do with, with film to make images like this. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. That this is the first body of work that I've ever done digitally, and I, I rather than making that an arbitrary decision just to sort of switch for um, no apparent reason, I wanted to do it with some sort of intent. I want to do something that I can't do uh, with the way that I've been working for the past thirty years. Um, so that was the idea. It was like make it make it have a reason. Uh -huh. Um, Danielle, um, you've been you've been leading um, tours of the exhibitions. I probably have more time sort of on the ground or in the space than the rest of us do. Can you talk a little bit about how um, uh, the classes you've been working with have, have interpreted the show? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, you know, I think that the conversations I'm having with our visitors. Um, or perhaps my, my own conversations, because myself, our colleagues, those of us who have been taking groups through the exhibition since it's opened, we've had over 800 university students come in from eight different departments who have seen 12 Hertz as part of their visit to the museum, whether it is a class visit specifically to look at that work or part of a larger visit, um, seeing the rest of the work on view in the museum and then getting to this gallery and thinking about it in context of what else they've seen. So I think from my own experience, taking the classes I have through, um, maybe my conversations with those groups have been perhaps less focused on materials or technique or process than uh, my colleague, Tom Sempre, who's our curator of photography and the colleague who worked most closely with you in um, organizing the show may have been having um, based on his um, you know, depth of knowledge as a photographer. But with my groups of students, I've found that we've been really focused on, I mean, they're eager to kind of share their response with me about the content, the imagery, the experience, their reactions in the space. Um, so it's sort of in short to, you know, Ron put out that question of, uh, is the work accomplishing what the artist wanted it to do? And so we're kind of, you know, in real time sorting that out in our conversations with each other. And um, we, and so, yes, I think, yes, my, anecdotally, my observation is yes, that when people are walking into the space, um, they are immediately having sort of a physical reaction to what they're looking at. And I like in the past when you've talked about that decision to go with the scale of these photographs, the format of an exhibition versus a book, because it breaks apart any possibility of someone thinking about the images in a linear way or thinking about them happening in a certain sequential order. Um, and one of our colleagues, uh, one of the faculty members who teaches in art history and environmental studies, um, Dr. Emily Eliza Scott, shared with us, um, you know, some of her student responses to the exhibition with their permission. And we had, you know, that great look into how students are writing about the work and some of the words that came out of um, my conversations in the space and students who wrote on the work were, you know, and some of these are kind of contradictory, which I think is a good thing, an interesting thing, like timeless and urgent or destabilizing, um, calling out the absence of color and the depth provided by black and white. And to see that picture of the blue and the calving ice that you shared is like a behind the scenes. It was amazing to see that color and think about how I react differently to seeing that versus the photographs in the exhibition. Um, and then describing the work as poetic, but also confrontational. Um, so I think they're having that experience in the space that you're describing, wanting to leave the door open for, for viewers of the work. I, I, th I think those contradictory terms that the students are using, um, that to me is very satisfying. Um, that, you know, it, it shouldn't be one thing. And I hope it is all of those things. And I hope it does, uh, you know, the job of um, becoming its own question, really. Uh, as a body of work, rather than just a polemic on climate change or something like that, which, you know, if, if that were the case, you know, who, who would that polemic be directed to, um, you know, uh, on a liberal university campus in a museum? Um, it's that's that's very much preaching to the choir, but hopefully a more complicated 
conversation can come out of looking at the work and, and thinking at the sort of broader uh, broader issues surrounding the work. Um, I want to um, uh, kind of ask Alan um, uh, to chime in a bit about um, you know, one of the things that um, when I started to write about this, uh, you know, all of Ron, the conversations that Ron and I were having were about the sort of impenetrability of the, the geological world and the, that, that sense of indifference. And then, um, you know, at the same time, you know, I get up every morning and you start reading the paper and, um, you know, just one more horrifying, um, you know, horrifying story after another. And um, that's when I sort of had this sense that, well, actually, you know, the earth is no longer um, sort of immune to our, uh, to our actions. And, you know, the most common thing you keep coming across is, well, you know, the Arctic is going to be ice free in 50 years, and then it was 30 years, and it was 20. And, um, you know, the most recent thing I saw is, you know, within 15 years, there will be no ice in the Arctic during the summer. Um, but there was um, an article and you know it's not i'm not reading the scientific journals but you know um bunny and the guardian that said that the the poles have shifted 12 feet because of the loss of um uh, the earth's axis has shifted 12 feet because of the loss of ice at, at the north and south poles so it's not something you know much like this that we're ever going to be able to perceive but what kind of um what kind of changes do you see to the um to the kind of indifferent physical world we've been talking about from anthrop anthropogenic changes. Well, you know, it's so. I, this reminds me of a, just a tweet that I saw not that long ago. Um, there was it was a PhD student who was who was talking about how they were concerned about climate change, and so they decided to to get into earth sciences and learn about I don't remember whether it was oceanography or or glaciology or where it was, and spent their time six years studying walked out with a phd and then realized oh it's a political problem um you know it, it, the truth is that that we've known uh, about the greenhouse effect um since the same year that oregon became a state was when john tyndall um became famous for for working out the greenhouse effect and measurements in in england um apparently preceded by an american scientist eunice foot um, here in the US, but in any case, um, that science has been so well established for so long. And it's really just in the last couple of decades that we've had the sa satellite measurements to be able to, to monitor changes in glaciers and, and, uh, and the sea ice in the Arctic, like you were talking about, um, to really nail down um, some of the processes beyond you know, any um, you know, to, to, to just finer and finer detail. And, and that's important work and it's ongoing work. And, and those of us that are interested in those processes um, have careers built off of the, that study and we'll, we'll continue to do that. Um, but, you know, in thinking about the climate crisis and the Anthropocene and, and the changes that we're making to the environment around us, um, you know, it's the scientists um, are, are always able to ask more questions, always able to find out more information and to develop a, a, a clearer picture and a, a, a more nuanced understanding. Um, but it's limited, you know, it's just like you, you asked the question earlier on, um, is an art installation going to, um, change the parameters of global warming or, or global change? And the answer is no. And is a scientific, another scientific study going to um, finally convince um, uh, our, our leaders and our policymakers to, to make choices that would put us on a different pathway? And the answer there is also no. Um, and, and so just as you know, we, we look at the images and, and we see um, you know, aspects that are, are beautiful and, and maybe frightening or, or intimidating um, in some cases. Um, this is what we get out of the science also. You know, we also get 
a, a, a clearer image of some things. Sometimes it's satisfying, you know, it's, it's, it's beautiful to, to be able to understand something in a more nuanced fashion. Um, and, um, but ultimately, you know, these, these are societal problems um, and um, we can, um, we can, you know, develop new cameras, I suppose, or develop new techniques for seeing um, what is going on, but the image is clear enough to know. Um, and we're really just um, fiddling with the details at this point. Can I, can I jump in there too? Because I like what you said about different techniques for seeing and, and being sort of forced to face or acknowledge um, you know, truth that humanity is a part of, but yet we're, it's so easy for us to day by day look away from or, or think it doesn't affect us. And um, we're, we've had over the last couple of months, although one of these shows just closed, we've had um, other representations of glaciers and icebergs on view in the JSMA in the work of Kay Walking Stick, who's painting of Athabasca Glacier is on view in the Common Seeing Exhibition, which it's an honor to be able to present this year on the traditional indigenous home, homelands of the Kalapuya people where we're situated. And so we have a painting, a representation of a receding glacier in the Canadian Rockies um, with its title, with its imagery, viewers sort of immediately understand what Kay Walking Stick is showing us with that painting. And then the show we just closed in our artist project space, which had another connection to UO faculty um, Colin Ives and Craig Phillips um, and the teams working with them, Aleph of Earth, a video, uh, an audio video piece that was directly and in its purpose and description meant to kind of draw our attention to the climate crisis. I think we've seen um, with, with art and what visual artists have been able to do sometimes is to make visible the invisible in a way that maybe it hits someone at a personal or political point in their own sort of means of understanding the world, but if that's the one thing that maybe changes the visual literacy of a viewer in thinking about, you know, um, how an artist has interpreted it and points it, you know, the artist's job is to point at it. So um, yeah. I think that's been really exciting to have those works on view at the same time for tours recently to talk with people about how are each of these formats affecting you. And then for viewers who might come to photography expecting it to be objective, documentary, truth-telling, sort of immediate assumptions about what photography does or is, kind of a questioning, you know, the role of the human being behind the lens um, in sort of telling those truths has allowed us to talk about um, all those different formats of art making in regard to this issue. Yeah. Um, Alan, I, I, uh, Ron, did you have, were you gonna jump in? Um, no, I just really appreciated what uh, both of them had to say, and I, I think Danielle just uh, articulated um, a, a pretty, you know, the pretty difficult idea around how work like this could actually have an impact in the conversation. Um, something that I'm not actually totally convinced of half of the time, um, but I think uh, Danielle just helped convince me. <laughs> Well, I, I love what you said about, you know, the artist, you know, the artist's job is to, is to point. And um, uh, it's, it, you know, something that um, uh, I've been thinking a lot about lately is, you know, how, how is it, how is it that, you know, a landscape photograph sort of functions in the, in a sort of larger, um, you know, larger uh, conversation. And it really is a, um, you know, it can only show you so much. You know, that frame is that frame is pretty limited when you think about the expansiveness of of, of the landscape. Um, but um, I think what it, it gives you the ability to do is sort of concentrate and focus on something that you more than likely would, you know, walk or drive or you know, fly right over. Um, one of the things about your work and and um, Ron is that when you're talking about that sense of scale. And I think that, you know, a lot of the, when you sort of, you know, pull the curtain back and say, well, here I am with the tripod and this is, you know, you know, this thing is much larger than you imagine, but in a certain way, they're very kind of claustrophobic images in that, in that sense. I mean, I think a lot of times, you know, um, a landscape photograph tries to give you this sense of, you know, everything that's out there beyond the edge of the frame. And these feel very sort of tightly focused internally that way. Um, and maybe some of that is, um, uh, some of that kind of um, 
that sense of sort of the threat, the kind of threatening nature of them or that kind of instability, I think comes from, you know, it's like you're turning the, turning the screws on them a bit. Yeah, the, the horizonless landscape was something that was kind of built into the program pretty early on. And it, it, that the word claustrophobic, I think, is, is a good one. Um, I, you know, I hoped that there would be some discomfort um, in the experience with the work. And that's if you go through the installation, you'll see there are moments of space where you actually get a sense of scale and where you are and, and where you're located. There are a few horizons. Uh, in the installation, and that's you know sort of by design, just to give you a little uh, a little space to move and breathe and sort of um, uh, move through the work uh, in a slightly more comfortable way. But yeah, that that's that was a a, a pretty um, important part of the program for me, for sure. Um, I wanted to just uh, get back to Alan um, the the comment you made about. You know, we've known about the greenhouse effect since the 1800s. Um, and uh, what I've thought about, in, you know, I um, uh, at some point had had um, visions of of um, being a conservation biologist, and then I you know, failed chemistry and decided art history looks so much better. <laughs> um, but that was, you know, in the sort of mid 80s. And I can't remember, you know, there was no discussion about climate change at that point, at least in a you know, sort of um, undergraduate academic level. I think about when um, uh, Arctic Dreams was published in 1986 and Barry had spent, you know, the previous decade um, in the American and Canadian Arctic. And the, the question he was sort of positing was, okay, you know, how are we as a society gonna, um, um, gonna basically, what's our response gonna be to this landscape? And is this just going to be um, you know, one more um, sort of uh, example of catastrophic resource extraction. And mm -hmm. we know how that sort of turned out. But it, I think if I'm correct, it was in 1988 that James Hansen first started talking about, um, about global climate change. So it was two years after this was published. And you think about, you know, on the one hand, um, Ron wants to, you know, sort of tease out these, you know, incredibly slow moving um uh geologic actions but what what we're looking at now is something that's you know it's speeding along at a rate that that we can't process that either in terms of how quickly it's happening yeah for sure um you know we you know there, there are aspects of of human actions on the planet that have have caused changes to to our um, our atmosphere, for example, that go back to the Romans. So, so if you drill down through the ice cap in, in Greenland and, and look at lead levels, you can see when they started to smelt lead, um, you know, back a couple thousand years ago. Um, and and I think that that many of us sort of grew up with the idea that that um, you know like when you look at Ron's photos that were very very small you know that that were as individuals looking at nature we we feel overwhelmed by it um, but now we're at a stage where there's seven billion of us and um, and we all want to live a comfortable life and and thankfully, many people around the world are beginning to be able to live more comfortable lives. You know, the, the incidents of, of inequality are huge, um, but possibly somewhat reduced from, from when we were children. Um, and, and so that's positive. But, um, but at the same time, you know, we, we're, we're consumers and, um, and we have, um, altered our planet in innumerable ways, and and we understand that now. You know, we we have the measurements, we have the 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 theory and the observations, and we test them, and we we build up an understanding. And and um, you know, you mentioned Hansen's work in the eighties, um, and and that has continued on um, with so many others since then, and and the picture has been so much. More closely refined, um, but um, you know, in in the earth sciences, I, I guess we're we're also 
interested in really, really deep time processes and, and looking at some of these um, photographs, for example, of the, of the rock crag that, that you drew our attention to earlier um, is one of the first slides. Um, you know, that's millions of years old, you know, or, or the picture with the smoke in the background from, the, um, from Northern California there with the, the lava flow that has clearly been eroded over a very long time period, you know, with the action of just, you know, water um, hitting that surface and changing it over those long, long periods. And, and um, you know, humankind has only been on the planet for, for you know, a couple hundred thousand years, and and as modern societies for and with cities and so forth for maybe like ten thousand years or so, you know, not very long really in the grand scheme of things. And and a lot of these geologic um, images that Ron is taking pictures of um, here to show in this exhibit, they will still be there. Um, long after we're all gone to um, and um, and really this is you know it comes down to to a, a problem of of how we inhabit our planet and how that affects other be beings on our planet um, but it's also you know how how humankind can can continue to thrive on this on this planet that we have um, based on what our actions are and what our policy decisions are again. Um, so the, there's, there's a, uh, you know, the, as scientists, I think uh, a lot of times, at least as an earth scientist, you know, and I'm trained as a physicist and a mathematician, which is about as far away from humanity as you can get, I think. Um, but, um, you know, if you ever spent any time in the applied mathematics department, um, I think that's a fair statement. Um, but, um, you know, so we, we like to, to try to look at the world uh, at the, the basic physical processes and focus on those alone and, and not think so much about, um, about consequences or, or our own role in, in possibly being able to adjust things. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, we're at a, time in, in society's development where, where um, um, we are changing our planet and, and um, it's good to be aware of that. Now, what to do about it is, again, it's a political and economic decision. Um, well, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, end on a question and um, I think I sent this out yesterday, so you know what's coming. Um, and then maybe John can um, uh, can bring in some questions from uh, from the audience. But um, looking at Ron's um, pictures, do you do you find um, uh, any kind of solace in this sort of stoicism and persistence of the physical world, or do do they just leave you feeling cold and alone, and um, that it's all just going to strip us off from the surface and be, we'll all be back just to the rock. Ron, I'll, I'll start with you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> but you made them. <laughs> well, and that's a fair question. And it's a question that I've kind of grappled with uh, for the past several years, both in terms of making this work and thinking about those things and, and you know, reading um, uh, everybody from Tina Camp to uh, Robert McFarlane uh, and uh, sort of thinking about uh, the sort of these issues in the broadest sense. Um, and, you know, on my darker days, I feel like it's, uh, you know, hopeless and that basically these are reassuring to me because the planet will, <laughs> will go on without us as it has with so many mass extinctions. Um, but on the other hand, I would, I, I would also like to think that somehow uh, we could be enlightened enough to sort of understand that it's, it's not, about us um, and it's, uh, you know, we're going to have to sort of find a way to sort of move forward as a species that not only allows us to survive, but allows, uh, you know, of so many other species to survive as well. And, you know, my honest feeling is that that's not going to happen until we're forced to do that. 
Um, and I know that doesn't sound very hopeful, but you know that's that's where the hope resides, I think. Danielle, <laughs> put you, you on the spot. You did warn us that question was coming. Um, you did, and I'm still kind of organizing my thoughts around it, but one of the things, and maybe this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but one of the things I've been thinking about this week as we've been preparing for this, and also because earlier in this week, um, John and I were talking about our shared appreciation for James Lavador's paintings, um, being an Oregon artist who lives on the Umatilla Reservation near Pendleton and is an enrolled Walla Walla member and, and paints and makes prints in response to the land, the Blue Mountains around Pendleton, and um, you know, works with he works with oil paints. They take a long time to dry, often large canvases, and the sort of the, the pushing and the um, evolving of the paint surface and paint as a material. He has always talked about that having a similarity with what he sees as the geological processes processes going on around, and walking is really integral to him sort of thinking about his life as a painter, walking the land. And um, so I've just been thinking about, you know, an artist like James Lavador, who says, I'm, these paintings aren't storytelling, they're representing a, a process. Um, and then thinking about this body of work, I mean, I think there's beauty in having the ability to observe what's happening in the land, we, we share um, acknowledgement of that. And that can be very unsettling when we think about all the other things it represents. But in terms of just the interaction with the image, I find solace in that and appreciate the artists who are doing that. And the way they're talking about their work is sort of, um, you know, in conversation with things much bigger than humanity's little blip on on the, uh, the grand timeline. Or I'll throw that to the, throw that to the scientist. Well, um, you know, I, I do take some solace in the in the fact that that um, you know the the processes that that are uh, responsible for forming um, the landscapes behind these images um, are unending in in a sense. Um, you know the the glaciers will continue to to move for a long time. Um, although there'll be less and less of them, of course, and you know the oceans will continue to roil um, and continue to break down those rocks. The tectonic forces aren't going to be much affected um, by our actions, um, and I, I. So those are kind of constants, um, in a sense. Um, it, thinking more about you know the what's behind your question, which is you know what what will happen to other sentient beings, you know, to other humans and, and to people that are living in vulnerable um, places and, and even to ourselves with having to deal with the wildfire smoke over the last several years, um, um, which has been a, 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 you know, a cause of, of lots of concern as well as health problems and, and so forth. Um, those things are sadly, I don't see, I don't have a lot of um, faith in our society to change those. Um, so that's, that is, um, you know, if I'm being honest, I, I don't, you know, if we're having lived through two years of a global pandemic and not seeing us make a lot of really intelligent choices along the way. It's, it's, uh, it was something that's so immediate and in your face um, to actually convince people to, to make choices that would be better for our planet over generational time scales is, seems like a big ask. Um, but, um, but having said that, um, I guess I'm kind of glad that I'll, I'll, I'll get to, to stick to my equations and my physics and continue to describe these beautiful things. Um, so, and, and yeah, I'll leave it there. Hi, Toby, is it okay if I, if I jump in here? Yeah, absolutely. We, we've got a couple of good questions that I wanna read. 
I uh, want to present, but I just want to say, uh, I want to thank everybody for this. And, and, um, and it, it's a gorgeous show. And I do want to acknowledge what uh, Danielle mentioned that um, Ron, since Toby couldn't come due to the pandemic and everything else, uh, Ron worked with our photography curator, Tom Sempery, to create this beautiful installation with our terrific um, prep staff here to make the show look so gorgeous. And they worked, they really um, figured out how to do the, the walls and just all the decisions there. And it really is beautiful. Um, I can't resist making a couple of comments in response to some of the things people said too. I, I think, you know, I think one of the things the show does teach is a kind of humility. And, and you, you said that maybe without using that word exactly in, in terms of our, what power we have as human beings. Yes, we're changing the planet, but, um, where if we don't watch out, we're, we're not going to have the power to fix it. It'll, it'll fix us. You know, that's what will happen. Um, also thinking about the question of preaching to the choir. You know something? I think that's OK, because I think the choir needs to sing louder. So and I think we need more people in the choir singing really loud. So I'm going to say, let's keep doing that and just do a better job at it and keep going. And I think these I think these photographs in a, in a certain way um, can do that. I also think that different people respond to them very differently, but I think that's also some of the power that they have there. But um, to me, they speak very loudly about the, the limits of human um, influence and power and how we're, we're like, we figured out how to screw it up, but we need to figure out how to not screw it up. And, and I think they, they do speak about that to me at least. Um, now I've got, here's a couple of good questions. Um, Ron, um, what would you say was the key moment in your process of creating this work that you knew the project was successful for you? Is it different from when you were working as an analog photographer? This is from Matthew Arnold. Um, the, the, the working process really wasn't different at all. In fact, I think decades worth of film photography um, is so embedded in me that I, I probably don't take a, advantage of many of the things that, uh, you know, making digital images offers in terms of ease, et cetera. I, I, I make it all very difficult for myself. Um, but in terms of when I knew the project was working, um, that, you know, I, I, I don't know because there's the process is always so sort of up and down. It was probably a good year into it before I started to see the possibility of something coming together that wasn't just a sort of, you know, redundant group of pictures, uh, something that was sort of expansive and that could mean something other than just the literal things that we were looking at. Um, so that's uh, kind of a vague answer, but you know, it, it's, it takes a while when, when you're first starting something like this or any other project, um, there's no roadmap. You don't really know what it is uh, for a while, and there's a certain leap of faith that you have to take, and and just doing the work and hoping that it's uh, you know. And there was a lot of work that was made that didn't make the cut. You know, false uh, false leads, uh, going down the wrong path for six months, and then making a correction. So it's it's always um, you know a tricky process. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, here's one from um, someone. An anonymous attendee. Uh, we were wondering if you see or hear different responses to the work from people who have visited or spent time in most of these environments. For example, feeling more positively connected and inspired as opposed to experiencing foreboding. Uh, is that a question for me? I think it must be. Um, Although if anyone, um, if anyone has walked through with Danielle or Toby or others and said, oh, I was at on, you know, I was in Hawaii and saw the, that, or I was in, the, in Greenland and, and watched a, a, a glacier calve or, or whatever. I mean, Alan might have actually been up in some of these places. So um, is, is it different? To, I think the question is, is, is it different to see these things only secondhand versus firsthand and secondhand is the impetus of the question. Well, you know, I, I think that as with any photograph, these are always, they're, they're translations of an experience. And so they're, you know, and then I sort of try to create uh, a world through the photographs, but it, it, the bottom line is they're still photographs. They're still of something out there in the world. And my sense is that 
just about anybody can look at just about any photograph and bring some sort of personal narrative to it and some sort of positive experience relating to it. And I, I think that's certainly the case with these. I, I think as an installation, it has a certain tone, um, um, but as individual images, I, I'm, I'm almost positive that um, somebody knows what it's like out at Yahats and <laughs> uh, can, so can sort of bring that, that personal narrative uh, to the images. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. I, uh, here's I, what... that, uh, I just wanted to say that I, I think that you know, when we started out talking, like, what do we expect of, of landscape photographs? And the the idea that you don't you don't title the prints with the location is just one more thing that kind of that um, you know. I think that we're all inclined to want to know where it was, and in a certain way, you're saying that you know it doesn't matter. That's not the point. And there is this, um, you know, it does create this sort of tension there. And I I think that. You know, there are there are likely people in uh, uh, you know who who come to the Schnitzer who recognize some of the sites, but as this travels around the country, it's going to get sort of further and further away from that, you know, from that territory. And I think that 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 sense of anonymity is one more thing that sort of puts this you know puts this distance between you know who we are and um, in relation to the planet. Yeah, and there's there's a, uh, definitely a certain stubbornness there, and and it, it's it's sort of an in, an intended device to only reference phenomena and not um, specific location. Um, so you can't as easily bring that personal narrative uh, or the idea of mapping and territory um, like uh, to to the photographs. So it's it's really about the things we're looking at for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's a question from Denise Halquist to Ron. Is there any place you were unable to photograph that you felt would have contributed to your narrative? Um, yeah, I still have a little bit of a, a, a mental checklist of things. Um, ultimately, I don't know that, um, I, you know, I'll pursue this particular project further. I feel, a, you know, a definitely a sense of closure with this exhibition and, and having published a book with it. But uh, uh, the, the, those, you know, giant crystal caves in Mexico, um, I would love to get down there, but they're, you know, logistically and everything else, um, whether or not I could actually make that happen, um, is another question, but yeah, I, I had, I had a whole fantasy checklist that I didn't get to, but I felt like I, I got to enough of them to make it work. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, um, any last comments from you, Toby? I think we're about ready to close. I'd just like to um, to thank everybody on the on the panel today, and um, again, uh, thank you, John, and and everybody at the museum. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you, Toby. Thanks to the Barry Lopez Foundation, and uh, I think this show is going to be going. It's got uh, at least three more venues. Uh, the um, next venue is the um, uh, the gallery at uh, uh, the University of Arkansas in Fort Smith. Uh, we'll be there this fall, and it will be going to the Frist Art Museum in early 2024. And uh, we're hoping to to have another uh, couple of venues in the middle. Okay, so, great. Uh -huh. And can I can I just say one last thing, John? And this sure. is yeah. in, refer in reference to what you said about preaching to the choir, because it's a, it's always. A little bit of a cynical thing to say that for sure and i understand that but i one of the reasons i think having an exhibition with the barry lopez foundation and specifically in institutional settings like this is that the choir does expand you know as opposed to you know simply exhibiting the work in commercial art galleries or art fairs where it's a very narrow range of people that actually get to see the work and i think in a museum you've got a much broader range of people coming through there, kids coming through there Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, you know, I, I totally agree and I, I completely appreciate what the museum is doing and, and how they're bringing the work in a kind of educational way to an audience. So mm -hmm. um, I didn't mean to seem too cynical about <laughs> what well, I, I, I think I understand <laughs> not wanting to uh, not wanting to claim too much for one's work, especially if you have high hopes and great worries. Um, <laughs> It's a way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I understand that impulse too. But um, but I st still do think the work, the work speaks eloquently, and it, it forces real questions. And I, I think we, I agree. We get a very broad audience. 
We get young people, we get students who are still formulating their ideas about the world very much, deciding what careers to move in, what, what choices to make, what ethical and moral choices to make. And all of us make those choices every day in small ways too. And one of the things that obviously that is causing climate change is, a, is literally billions and billions of those choices over time. And um, the only way to affect uh, it is gonna be to have literally billions of people making somewhat different choices over time. And, and those can add up. I think we, we have to believe that um, or it truly is hopeless. So um, well, even I'll, I'll on days when it's hard to, hard to be very optimistic and we've had a few of those. <laughs> um, I'll just, I'll close on uh, uh, when you sort of, you know, what are the chances that we're gonna, you know, look at the last 5 billion decisions and make 5 billion different decisions um, uh, the, theoretically correct decisions on the other end and 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 you know how do you deal with that as an individual and um uh i'm, I'm gonna bungle the quote but it was from the photographer frederick sommer and and he basically said you know you have to you know do what you know how to do no less well than you can do it mm -hmm. and i think that that's that's the you know what we all you know the the what we all face mm -hmm. um you know we can you know, we're all we all we're all moving forward, whether you know whether or not we want to. Um, but there's only so much we can there's only so much we can affect as individuals. But um, if we all have that that goal of of, um, of uh, you know doing our part um, as well as we can, maybe there's you know there's some opportunity there for for hope. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks uh, for a beautiful show, Ron. Um, Alan, uh, Danielle, uh, Toby, thanks for being here today. And the show is on view um, through uh, March 13th, I believe. Uh, so we hope everybody gets a chance to see it before it goes on to its um, next venues. So again, signing off here from the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon. Thanks to everyone. Thank you.